Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Um, tonight, we have a very special event. Um, I would just like to begin with a few thoughts about Ireland, about what it means to bring architects from Ireland today to the school. Um, obviously, when one thinks of architecture in the world today, um, and thinks, let's say, of a very progressive idea of architecture, in particular focusing on the English-speaking West, um, it is both uh, you know, easy to overlook and to find oneself focusing very intensely on this country because it is as you know, squeezed uh, directly between uh, the giants, as you could call them, the US and the UK. But for those who've become captivated by it, um, it becomes very clear that we're faced with something very distinguished on the one hand and obviously indistinct in many ways. At the same time, it really resists classification, and yet there's something that draws these architects together. Um, it's a place like ours, you know, which has had at its beginnings a kind of... Um, international neoclassicism and Gothicism dominating architectural culture in the 19th century. And, and these were the kinds of backgrounds all of us broke away from here and in the UK as well, as you know. Um, and we could say that that is lurking in the background, but that at the same time there's a kind of unconscious memory of something else, which are certain kinds of historical exceptions. Um, think, for example, of the late 19th century Celtic revival uh, you know, which paralleled the Gaelic movement in literature there. No one could argue that its influence is explicitly evident in, for any extended period that followed, yet what we see again and again in Ireland are subtle inflections born partly in its own history. One of the reasons the arrival of modernism is distinct in Ireland is because it's play, it played out primarily with most intensity at the small scale. And perhaps it's owing to this and those unconscious memories that we can speak of a subtly regionalist approach to modernism, um, a cultivation of a decidedly tectonic language as opposed to the atectonic abstraction that would become all too vulnerable to corporate consumption as happened here and in the UK. But perhaps the period with which we most readily identify the contemporary work that we're seeing now uh, begins in the 80s when the economic slowdown, like somewhat like the one we're having now, spurred a new conscious recognition of the possibility of an identifiably Irish architecture with an emphasis on historical context, the environment, and urbanism, public housing, in this time was far more successful in dealing with the balance between the integration and segregation of public and private spaces than we witnessed in the UK or, needless to say, in the US. Numerous renowned reno renovations in Ireland set the stage for what some recognize as a particularly Irish sensitivity to the development of a kind of tectonic language capable of integrating disparate constructional systems and customs without eradicating their identities. Tonight we have this pleasure, a very distinct one, of hearing from four of the leading contemporary Irish architects. This is part of Irish Architecture Now, a program which again distinguishes Ireland as it is initiated by its National Architecture Foundation, um, which places unusual emphasis on cultural dissemination internationally. The symposium is part of Irish Arts in America, curated by Raymond Ryan at the Carnegie Museum of Art, and is also supported by Enterprise Ireland. So we have three presentations tonight. Um, I'll begin by introducing our first speaker, which will be Neil McCullough, who I thought I would call Niall, but he can go either way, he's told me. Um, he is the co-founder of Natalie I mean, sorry, uh, McAuliffe Mulvin Architects, excuse me, um, in Dublin. And the most renowned work includes cultural and civic buildings, libraries, schools, such as the Ulster Library? 
okay, the Long Room Hub, the Dublin Dental Hospital, the Waterford City Library. In all of these, there's a focus on a definition of a new idea about public space. They extract spatial qualities from Ireland's diffuse light and grayness and introduce forms with a strikingly stark character. And this, I think you will see, and most of you already have seen, has this very ex uh, extraordinary and uncanny familiar quality when you think about it with reference to the kind of vernacular, but or a modern vernacular, but at the same time is monumental. These, their techniques in dealing with these characteristics are applied in very diverse ways, and it would be, again, not easy to summarize, but we, I hope we will, and I'm sure we will be seeing how it's worked out. I did want to note one very important point in their work, which really marked an historically significant shift. Um, their Dunn, Leary, Rath, Down civic office building was a pilot project for local governance following the decentralization of the government in Ireland. And this was really important because it was the first in a whole series of projects that dealt with the delivery of architecture uh, transparently and democratically following upon the new U EU directives that came online at in, in that time. Um, and so we see from that that this was really a model uh, that launched a new mode of practice in Ireland. They've written extensively. Their work is widely published and awarded. The firm has represented Ireland at the Venice Biennale. Um, I should mention that McAuliffe has taught at University College Dublin, Queen's University, Belfast, and, and as visiting critic in Spain, Lausanne, the Welsh School of Architecture. He's really someone many people will recognize. And it's really great to have you here tonight. Welcome. Thank you, Scott. Hi, everybody. Um, I suppose we were, we've been talking about this as we go along, and I suppose um, we have a proposition, which is that we're, what we're presenting is not really about an Irish architecture. It's more about contemporary architecture, mostly of the public realm, um, with different levels of scale and different levels of engagement with a very particular uh, place and environment and very different means of engagement with that place. And um, hopefully also about showing some of the energy of architecture in a small place with, limited, with very limited resources. Um, that is, I think, maybe of wider interest in the world. In terms of our own work, I'm going to start on it. Um, don't know whether projects come to you or you go to projects, but we've ended up doing a lot of small public buildings that tend to be embedded in very defined contexts um, and hollowing space out for new lives from material that's imprinted already. And our creativity has tended to be um, partly a judgment about how much you do or how little you do and when to stop. And I think um, some of that is about engaging with geographies of place, uh, which are man-made, um, natural, landscapes, small towns, existing buildings, um, in their abstract physical sense, but also the mental geographies of history, place, um, and culture, uh, which is maybe less definable, which is more about taking the barometric pressure of things. Um, than it, it is actually defining it um, in physical terms. So I, I want to talk about the, imp I suppose the impact of those things on three projects. One is a landscape project, or a building in landscape. One is an existing building, and uh, one is set in Dublin, the capital city uh, in Ireland. And I suppose the first thing, the, the first project, just this, the general issue that Scott mentioned at the Irish landscape, I think is um, probably a good example. Uh, you see the images there. Um, there's this issue, uh, it's, it's quite a particular climate, uh, there's a very strong thing about uh, moving cloud, moving sunlight, um, um, a lot of grayness, an awful lot of moisture, a lot of erosion, uh, incredibly dense vegetation which can actually swallow up buildings. It's an extraordinary thing of, of, of um, if, if you let it, a building will vanish. <coughs> and also ruin. I think is a particular issue to do with history, where uh, the countryside is dotted with ruins. And obviously, that's a, 
that's a, that's a, that's a physical fact, but there are clearly overtones with the European landscape tradition uh, to do with maybe the darker sides of our kind of the classical landscape tradition, not the European tradition, just the, 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 the issue of dark places, of um, uncomfortable forests, of um, Claude Lorraine-like issues about ruin, and maybe about the frailty of construction, about the difficulty of making things last. And um, this project we were asked to do was for a city morgue uh, quite near Dublin, and it was on the site of uh, an 18th century designed landscape, which is quite important in, in terms of enlightenment history in Ireland. The, sm the, the small image is a building called the Casino, designed by Sir William Chambers. It's, it's a fantastic centralized uh, folly. Uh, and the rest of the site's overbuilt, but the site we were given is up towards the top of that site in the brown, where there was a site of another folly, which was the Gothic folly. So we were asked to design a building relating to unexpected death beside a Gothic folly in a, pl in a planned landscape, which had, which had a lot of capacity. And so the way the building emerged was as, um, as was something dealt with erosion and dealt with that issue of, of, of frailty, um, cutting into a Portland stone rectangular box where light was needed and entrance and doorways were needed. At some level, an issue of metaphor of, of as, the, as the body is cut into for examination, that light, um, that the building would be cut in for light. And that building sat in a garden, which was, if you like, the same, the same plan form as the building, with a series of raised and sunken um, uh, volumes within that, kind of capturing um, the plan in the, in the, in, in the negative. And that sat in the landscape. You take the square building being the casino. <coughs> the other building is up there at the top of the image with the garden behind it. And um, we discovered later that there was actually an or ornamental lake in the foreground also. But they had this um, kind of interesting suburban relationship, almost like two houses that were, that were surrounded by their own hedges and fences um, with this kind of pregnant possibility of being linked, um, not seen by one another but kind of adjacent to one another. And um, it, that's like a long story that comes, that comes around because the building, um, if, if, if you take it in the, the context of, of, of uh, um, exploring that notion of ruin, exploring that notion of frailty, the building project actually stopped because the contractor went bust. And um, the building is now essentially its own archeology. span It's effectively um, a ruin. So it's, it's a case of being careful what you wish for. But also, it has the fascination for any architect of a building at its most essential. And the way light falls on materials and the way that rooms stand in it has its own complete fascination. And overtones, and perhaps of other buildings, to do with death uh, <coughs> in recent history that are, are kind of floating around there. The, um, the, the second project relates to an existing building, and, and um, um, I think there's, there's, a, there's, a, there, there's a deep pleasure in working with existing fabric of any kind, just in the abstract, before we even start talking about the building. There's something about the rubbed nature of old materials that has, um, there's some truth about that. There's some truth about its relationship with um, the kind of extended, strung out nature of life. You have this kind of, that's the nature of the way that things age. And um, this building was uh, a church, and you can see it there in the images, the exterior and the interior, a type very common in Ireland, and no longer used as a church. And you can see, you see it's kind of a slightly grim interior. And again, some existing buildings can change, some nothing should happen. That's actually a judgment call. But in the end, this, this, this was a building we, where we felt something could, could actually happen to it. And the same sense, I suppose, um, we wanted to make a project which was layered. Um, this, this wasn't a matter of, of, er, of eradication, but of taking that, that, that same concept of, of almost dealing with this like an abstract piece of geography, just looking at a space as if it was a cliff face, simply, but also taking on board its religious origins and its age, and in some way trying to make a layered response to that. Um, it was in a site, a place called, a town called Rush, just, no, just north of Dublin, uh, right by the sea, very windy, 
Um, and again, the building was to be a library uh, with all of the potential that libraries have in society to be public space, especially in wet climates. Again, it's the only place you can go and no one's going to ask you why you're there. <clears throat> and um, I suppose partly to do with its, its, uh, its uh, just partly to do with the existing monumental nature of the building, and partly I think to do with the windy environment. The response was to internalize the change. And I think that's again a judgment. Um, uh, you, can, you can make a heart on the sleeve addition to a building or a change to it that can be seen on the outside that's a very clear reference to change. It doesn't always have to be that way. And in this case, we simply changed around the, um, the original graveyard into this garden, uh, which was laid out with uh, these concrete strips with, um, with, uh, with planting between them. And internally, tried to build up this kind of layered response to what was going on, which, which um, included uh, kind of trying to fanatically restore what was left of the existing fabric. I think in that nature of the reading of contemporary arch architecture against old fabric, the complete uh, faith to the existing fabric is very important. So dealing with that, and then trying to use the... Um, the, the, trying to use the existing nature of the building with the nave and the odds and the choir, instead of, instead of just, just um, betraying it, trying to use that character in some sense to add to what was going to go on. So it's, what that came out was really was painting everything inside white, so it became like a hologram of itself, but leaving um, the space where the choir was bare as a focus and as a place for art where the altar used to be. And then putting something into it that made it work. Uh, as a library and making a judgment about that, what that was, whether it was an autonomous object, whether it was something that could almost not exist in your mind without a knowledge of the church, that's the, that's the kind of line that that, that that kind of went along. But that, that's essentially what went in. Was, it's almost like a folded piece of paper that went into the building, sitting away from the edges of it. You can see from the small drawing, it's almost like something when you fold it out, it's like a kind of folded piece of paper. But it has a kind of a tenuous um, stability and um, some linkage perhaps in that with the nature of the Gothic building that it's sitting in, that kind of, some commentary about the, the nervousness of Gothic structure. And in plan, I think again, just this, this, this game of judgment about how far you bring the intervention and change. In this case, see the lower drawing is the ground floor plan. And the building f fitted into the nave, but just came right to the edge of the nave, didn't go any further. Uh, the choir was translated into a place for art, so the transept zone was left as a field of play between the two of them. And then upstairs, um, it was turned into galleries, essentially. There was, uh, you can see them there, kind of folded out there on the upper floor plan, one making a kind of a meeting room, which is enclosed, and the others as kind of open space. And the environment, a um, few things about that when you do that, I think, and this is all about the, just, again, a judgment of what happens the old when you add the new and how do the two relate together and so on. You make a new environment, clearly you can, in that place where light changes that I'm talking about, you're making a, um, almost a modulator of light. You can, you can change that in kind of interesting ways. Things come and go quite a lot there. Um, but also you can no longer see the original environment fully in any way. You're, you're always looking at it at, at different angles. And in formal terms, um, the original route that led from the door of the church to the choir is now folded and bent around. So it's the same, but no longer a route that's clear. You have to actually move around it and through it to get there. And also the, the materiality alters in the sense that the old heavy is now white and gone, and the new is dark and um, in certain lights can be quite somber. And then you get... Um, you get relationship with some of the existing elements in the building, like the confessionals, like the monuments and so on, which are there, but, n but not exact. They kind of talk to each other. It's, it's, not, it's not exactly the same. And the third um, relates to the city of Dublin. I don't know how many people kind of know it, but there are many Dublins. Obviously, it's quite a big city, um, but I'm talking about where our work has been is in the center of the city. Uh, where you have all these Georgian streets and terraces and squares, but like Boston, the same, the same section of uh, big buildings at the front and then kind of uh, smaller, um, lower muse buildings at the back of it. And the, the image below is kind of like a, um, it's kind of a mad psychogeography of all, a lot of tiny projects that we 
designed over the years, which are just fitted in. There's no, there's no pattern to that bar the fact that we've done them. And all of them at some level are, um, they have a loyalty to the urban idea. And um, I suppose all I'd say in it is, is, is that in terms of responding to a city and the way you build in it, I think there are probably a number of elements in your armory for, for dealing with it. it, it it's, it's no longer, it's certainly, it's certainly not a matter of evolving a, um, a formal pattern or a formal way of building or designing. I think there's lots of different ways of doing it. One is simply by juxtaposition, clearly. That's a, that's a block, that's just a, um, a new apartment looking down over a square. Simply by respecting urban, just that dogged thing about urban edges which vanish and disappear everywhere all the time. That's a school just on, on, a, on a street. And um, th there's, also the, uh, there's also perhaps also an almost typological element. Some cities fall into typologies more easily than others. Um, Places like Rome don't. Dublin does. It's all the same. You can actually see it the same way. It happens all. You 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 walk into a building. You go up the stairs. You look at the back. It's almost all the same. And the just small buildings that pick up some of that and the way the glass and things are reflection windows. And at maybe at, at bigger scales in university buildings, the same thing. Almost looking for um, dealing with um, that those kind of buildings that are between ordinary and monumental, and trying to find. Um, an autonomous language for those where where the difference in them is quite restrained. You have to go up closer to look at it, like fractured skins that you need to go close to within volumes that are that are quite that are quite straightforward from 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 the outside and play quite strong urban design rules at the end of it. But the particular just the particular project was, I think at the end of it, um, one of our strong senses is, is that, again, working with existing buildings and cities is a huge area. It's a huge issue in Dublin um, about what to do about this. And some re-engagement with that at a radical level is, is, is a real way forward if you can kind of garner the various uh, powers that are necessary to do that. But this is, um, this is, a, very typical, uh, this is a very typical part of the city. Uh, five single buildings which were joined together to make offices and a library for a dental hospital. Again, very strong uh, cross walls, very strong spine walls, and so on and so forth. Um, and because they were ordinary, I think the issue of change was possible. Um, the plan there at the top just shows the typical plan. Um, I'm sure, again, very like Boston with kind of cross walls, very strong cross walls and staircases and so on at the back. And then on the bottom is just... Um, what we did, I think we, we, we made a long passageway through it with a series of kind of vertical um, uh, circulation zones and light wells that simply came down to it. It was a case of, of, of trying to really, really take the building by the hair and do something um, uh, that, that transformed it. And uh, as well as the corridors at the bottom that link it across the spine walls, it's also making on the top of it a series of library pods which um, are sitting on each one of the, on each on, on each one of the separate buildings. And the corridor is like, a, I suppose it's like a Corbusian street in the air. It simply runs down between the buildings and you get access into offices on both sides and you get, you get a series of lateral views. Um, and you can look across and then the buildings on the far side of the street become your, become your, become your, other, your, your other elevation. Uh, and then upwards and downwards through the various, through the various kind of um, sections of it. And the second part of that was to um, actually take off part of the roofs at the back of the building. Again, from, a, from the point of view in the city where it was, these are kind of nearly invisible. And I think we're very interested in that, and again, that notion of the ordinary. This, isn't, um, uh, this is simply sewn in. It's like microsurgery. Um, and then s placing a series of pods on top of that back section, which are, which are like that. Um, and their, their plan has disciplines and freedoms in the sense that the width of each of these... Th th these four boxes form a library, which is different levels, which which connect together. But um, the width is fairly fixed because you're you're sitting on the spine walls of the houses below. But the but the extent to which they stick out and the height of them is within the control of the architect. So you get you get a view, but you also get how you can you you're you're free to deal with them in that uh, basically in that kind of way. And you get that kind of view at the end. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now I'd like to introduce 
Buholtz McAvoy Architects, um, a firm founded in 1996. Um, their projects include the Fingal County Hall, the Limerick County Council Headquarters, Environmental Research Institute, and entrance, entrance pavilions at Langster House. But, um, oh, well, let me say that Merritt uh, Buholtz is originally from the United States where he studied architecture at Cornell and Princeton and is head of the School of Architecture, University Limerick. And Karen, Karen is, in fact, Irish. <laughs> she was educated at the University College Dublin. Um, their, the work is recognized for its distinctive focus on the relationship between environmental, urban, and rural issues. Um, it's their project Elm Park which really stands out in providing a new model for urban development. It was in response to a European environmental agency review which called Dublin a worst case scenario of urban planning, noting its housing sprawl and reactionary policies that followed from the failed high rise housing of the post-war period. But this is not the only aspect of the project that sets it apart. Its innovative environmental features make it one of the most advanced green developments in Europe today. In particular, the, building draw, the buildings draw on a microclimate for ventilation, and the prevailing winds are used as a design motivation. This distinguishes them in the sense that it actually sets the buildings out on the site in their work. In this particular case, the buildings are following a north-south axis, axis. And they have done this kind of work in many of their projects where ventilation schemes produce a, a very new and interesting organizational logic. Um, they are also known, and this always has been interesting to me, uh, for their uh, exceptionally innovative use of thermal chimneys. Um, well, with that, please welcome Karen um, and Merritt. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. We'll have to just go into this other thing. Sorry. So this is a this is a satellite image of Ireland last winter, under an uncharacteristic blanket, but perhaps to be more frequent, blanket of snow, um, and it's, it reveals the island in its vulnerability in a way to weather systems, to the southwesterly prevailing winds, and the constantly buffeted by changing weather systems, constantly changing. I mean, it's part of the uh, it's always in the forefront of Irish consciousness as people go around about their daily lives of the, ch the changing weather. And of course, then there's the larger um, change in climatic, uh, global climatic uh, conditions, which we're also vulnerable to. Um, as Scott said, we've, we've been working in, in Ireland for the last 15 years, and in this context, in, as I just mentioned, and we're just, I'm just going to talk about a number of concerns and interests that have been woven into and directed our work over that time. Um, and in some ways, they're kind of encapsulated by this little pavilion that we just did very recently, a few weeks ago, in, uh, it was actually for a music festival in, in Ireland. But it, um, as I say, it kind of encapsulates these concerns, one being about creating settings for public uh, civic activities in, a, in, in the civic realm in a changing Ireland. Um, and the second being about um, creating building, creating projects that, that, uh, breathe, that, that breathe, that are responsive to the larger natural environments, landscape settings, and um, that are permeable to light and air, harnessing uh, renewable energy, and thus being low energy buildings. And thirdly, um, a concern about materiality, of engineering materials in shaping spaces and sometimes um, innovative, innovative ways, perhaps. Um, in the uh, pavilion for the uh, electric picnic, um, I guess we worked with the boat builder and we learned um, in working with the boat builder about um, how oak, cedar, and pine um, worked in these kind of Irish canoes. And this is a model that we had made of um, one of these kind of shells. And 
you know, pine uh, is kind of rough, and you see it here in the in the kind of bottom of the image. Um, and the way that pine and uh, oak can be joined in a boat is pretty mm, pretty low tech and high tolerance. Um, but the strength in the oak is in its uh, is when you you know kind of steam it and bend it. Um, and then uh, on top of this were placed these kind of um, uh, cedar um, elements that kind of make this shape. So you kind of see these three, it was this kind of called a, a, a structure where each of the um, uh, shells sort of sit on the other shell to make this very small enclosure. Um, but I guess um, a kind of material concern also takes you other places. Um, when we renovated um, this uh, paper factory in Berlin in kind of former East Berlin, and one of the things we made there was a table, which has got this foam, um, aluminum foam kind of panel top, which is really thin, because we wanted to make this table very, very light, and um, but at the same time, responsive to the touch and something that's nice to write on. Although people, you know, they say they like to write, but they don't. Uh, so it also works well for an optical mouse, so it has this, um, you know, kind of linoleum top, which is a little bit like leather. Um, and a kind of beautiful timber edge. And now this table is being made by um, Unifor in, in Italy and is going into the University of Sheffield School of Architecture. But our work really, I suppose, so Scott talked about Elm Park. We're actually not going to talk about that project. We're going to talk about maybe the things that led up to that, which is, um, which are these civic office buildings. Um, we've made um, three civic office buildings over this period of, of 15 years. And um, it's kind of seemed like one project rather than three projects, um, because they all kind of deal with similar issues about um, the openness and transparency of, of local government, about um, buildings that are low energy um, and responsive to the environment, but also responsive to the use aspect of the environment, the fact that you know humans are the things that seem to actually push back somehow. Um, and buildings need to be kind of teaching places about that. Um, and finally, places that are um, uh, great places to to work and um, to carry to play out life within because many all of these buildings are full of not only the public but of um, people who work in them. Yeah. So as as Merit mentioned, it, 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 this building was for um, local authority in Fingal in Swords, north of Dublin, for 450 employees. But also, it was an important uh, interface between the local, this new local authority and its community, and also created uh, a new type of working as well, ways of working within within the organization. People Prior to this, these people had been housed in um, in a lot of Georgian um, buildings um, scattered across the city and didn't actually know each other. So it also brought with that um, these new ways of working. This um, project was uh, located in a, at the end of the main street in Swords, opposite an old uh, medieval castle and on the site of an old town park. So we really wanted to stitch it into this context and also uh, keep, um, keep some of the echoes of the old park. So even though the site was, was very tight, we wanted to maintain this um, crescent of old oak trees on the front of the site and um, a very beautiful Him Himalayan cedar here. So we um, kind of um, shaped the building to uh, to echo this in a way. This is the front of the building where you come up underneath. The entrance really becomes an extension of Main Street up under the canopy of these trees into the main public space of the atrium. So this arc in the front is um, creates, uh, uh, houses all the civic interface, let's say, the council chamber, the public counters, the interview rooms, the public cafe, um, where the council meets the community. Uh, uh, basically, whereas at the back we have all the, in these thin fingers, we have the working um, spaces for the employees. This is the image of the f front um, public space with a very thin, transparent veil between it and the, and the trees and the main street. This is just a um, quick overview of the environmental strategy of the, uh, the project where we studied in, in a lot of detail, the, the conditions of summer day, summer night, winter day, winter night, and how we could how we could allow the building to breathe. We have a very moderate climate in Ireland. Air conditioning really isn't necessary, um, so the building is totally naturally um, ventilated and lit, using the atrium as a lung, um, also as a smoke reservoir for fire. For fire. Um, and then the offices themselves are very narrow footprints, so they can be easily um, daylit and 
ventilated. These are the facades on, of, of the office bars at the back. They're on an east-west axis, so they have a, a south facade and a north facade, each of which are treated quite differently. So they're fine-tuned into, into this, um, responding to the, the sun path and winds. So, for example, this is the south elevation where we're minimizing solar gain, but at the same time trying to balance the amount of daylight, so maximizing the amount of daylight we could get in. This is from the point of view of, of a user sitting inside where they can get up and open a window. Um, or these vertical ventilators, which um, uh, allow the, uh, the office to be ventilated when there is wind-driven rain, which we let, get a lot of in Ireland. You can also see the natural um, daylight coming in there. We have very high floor-to-ceilings along the edges of the facades by putting all the services, which are usually in the suspended ceilings, above into the raised floor, which frees up the soffit to be sculpted to um, throw daylight as far back into the building as we can. It also complements the artificial lighting strategy, so... We created these, um, we designed these light fittings which throw light up onto this soffit. So we have this nice um, ceiling of ambient light um, as opposed to down lighters which might, uh, which cause problems with computer screens and the like. So we went, th looked at a lot of different profiles to develop these um, fittings. This is the council chamber um, which has this uh, direct engagement with, with the trees outside and with the main street. The atrium is, um, the, well, it's about breathing, but it's also about vision and transparency. So it's a big single glazed screen that hangs uh, from a, a roof, uh, beams that are cantilevered off of a concrete frame. Have these kind of um, timber uh, spar elements. Um, I should say that the, the trusses basically span horizontally about 36 meters. So, um, you know, it's very transparent at eye level at each of the kind of balcony um, balconies. Um, the shaping of this structure was kind of really important in, in the sense, I mean, this is a competition that we won kind of from our apartment, so we were really interested in absolutely every detail of this, but we knew almost nothing about how it was going to be built. So we were working with um, very closely with the contractors and the engineers, um, which is something that really is kind of stuck with us. Um, but this shaping process, you know, came down to all of these kinds of elements. This is all little sketches that we did of these kind of timber spars that hold the that hold the um, tree, and I remember, I hold the glass uh, opposite the tree that, that Karen was talking about, but I remember in particular, um, you know, going down to uh, Turin in Italy where this facade was being made, the, um, it, was, it was engineered in, in, in Paris by RFR, um, and meeting the guy who was kind of doing the welding of this stuff, and we were kind of complaining about the fact that you could see the welds, and he was very passionate about these welds, and he, he kissed one of them at one point, so we figured, well, okay, We'll let it go, and that I think characterizes um, how our relationship to, to 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 that kind of making. This building is um, another county council office building. Uh, it's in the suburbs. Um, it's in front of a shopping mall. There's a McDonald's just around the corner. There's uh, a huge housing estate that actually um, has grown a lot even since the building was finished. This one was finished in 2003. Fingal was finished in 2000. So these buildings are. You know, uh, uh, they're, they, they've been there for a little while now. Um, the strategy was, or the problem, I guess, was how do you create a civic place in this suburban place? And um, so we decided to make the building as big as we could with the brief, the amount of program that we had. Um, and that went very well with this idea of permeability, of thinness, of, uh, you know, making structures that were not just expressive, but were permeated by light and air. Um, so there's this... Uh, kind of setting back of the building and this kind of park landscape in front of it, um, which was uh, trying to make a connection to the park landscape behind um, the site so that people understood that this was set more in nature than in this kind of artificial landscape. Um, the kind of deployment of the uh, office, uh, most of the office floor plates is on this 75 meter long bar, which kind of achieved the length that we needed. Um, and it was facing into the, uh, facing south, basically south, south, slightly southwest. So um, this, this space, this is a section through this bar, became um, the, it's the main civic space. This atrium is the main civic space of the building, but it's also the main kind of ventilation um, lung. And it, works mainly through uh, pressure difference. Um, there's not enough thermal energy really in Ireland to drive stacked ventilation, but wind energy is kind of constantly available. So 
Um, we put the, uh, uh, then we had, of course, this problem with the sun because it was facing to the south, which it had to be for the wind. So that all of the structure was placed on the outside. So you have this very prominent kind of structure which acts as a briselet, as a sunshade. Um, and behind that, you have the, the kind of glass structure. And you see it sort of ripples um, because we have this, the structural uh, component is actually uh, only the west-facing part of the truss, uh, whereas the briselet are these kind of east-facing um, elements. And here you see it. The, the, yeah, this was a, a little model that we did, and then um, eventually um, the structure. So from the inside, it's quite it's quite uh, open and kind of bright, um, and all of the office spaces then are stacked. This is a staircase that takes you up to the public spaces. Um, the concrete, which is amazing, I think it poured uh, in situ concrete, cast concrete in Ireland is fantastic. Um, so a lot of you know energy, uh, our energy went into kind of with the engineers. Um, shaping this uh, concrete so that it could reflect light, as Karen talked about in Fingal. And in, um, in, in Limerick, it has a similar sort of uh, relationship to the facade and the ventilation system, and finally the council chamber. And this third um, county hall is, is in Mullingar, in, the, in a town in the center of Ireland. It's um, a different setting again. It's, it's a more complex setting embedded in a, on a site where there are already a number of civic um, buildings opposite a, a courthouse here existing county hall, uh, county building here with the council chamber in it, which was still going to be used. And then the remnants of an old um, jail and um, jail yards, which um, the, the client was a bit ambivalent about keeping, actually. When, when we came to the site, once the archaeological dig was done, they were quite happy to cover it all in concrete. But we wanted to retain them and, and weave the new into, into the old um, parts of the site. And also there was this park, which... Um, we wanted to um, uh, turn back into a public park and, be, and, and bring into the building, as it were. Um, so this, um, this is the, the different elements. These are the old jail buildings, the county hall building here. And so we tried to weave the new around the, the elements of the old. And this is the, the library. There's, in this building, there was also a public library, which required had, had to have a zone autonomy as well. It's opening at different hours, um, and it kind of gets slotted in um, and uh, pulled out as well to reveal uh, the foundations below. Um, so we're trying to gather all of these elements into one um, ensemble, let's say, um, um, on, under this large roof. So reinterpreting the site in a way uh, for, and creating a new civic space for the town. It also had a level change of four metres, which heretofore had been about surveying the prison yards below from the governor's house. But we used that opportunity to create this cascading stairway that would be about um, continuing this, uh, con this sequence from the main street down, permeating through the old elements into the new space below. So this is the existing county building in front and our building peeking up there behind. Um, so this is how it developed with the um, large atrium roof there and the bridge across to the library. This is going down the stairs um, cr under the bridge this is to the library entrance. And the old buildings there. And this looking back to the connection, which brings you back into the um, council chamber from the councillor's rooms above. And this is where you have the, this kind of... Um, Ten tension uh, between the old and the new and the roof embracing the old. This is the atrium itself with the office spaces to the left overlooking it through this veil of linen clad vertical panels that um, both provide an acoustic buffer and also um, modulate the ventilation. And this is looking back at the old. Um, and this sh shows the public spaces and the counters and the kind of library element, the timber element, um, sandwiched in there in the middle and the public main public access up the timber st these timber clad stairs um, the this kind of armature um, because the site was so complex you know kind of keeping the principles of making thin permeable buildings um, gave us a pretty complex geometry um, so this uh, you can see the office space is this sort of curved spine part, and then the library is this kind of bar that's pulled out. Um, and they all turn and twist a little bit and face kind of different ways. So these facades develop, if you like, as they go uh, as you go around the building. So this is kind of looking from the other side, the south, actually, the south elevation. So this is the offices and then the library here, and then this is the kind of bits of the existing county buildings. Um, and then on, uh, so the south facade 
um, is uh, a kind of double facade um, because we have the train line, which you can just see off here to the in the left of the image. So there's a kind of acoustic role that it plays. Um, because of the um, uh, southern exposure, we were able to use this actually as a uh, as a as a small thermal kind of motor. So um, this is a little transolar um, with the uh, environmental engineer's diagram of the, the kind of CFD model of that. It worked well because the um, uh, dimension of this sort of thermal motor, this sort of uh, heated up space was uh, kept uh, within the floor slabs. So you have a kind of an op a hit miss uh, kind of ventilation panel that when the sun is uh, striking the facade, um, uh, starts to uh, drive uh, the ventilation of the of the office spaces. So here you see kind of the hit miss um, sort of vents and this is sort of st standing inside between these layers of um, uh, of, of facade, and then the library is uh, facing mainly to the east and to the south. So it has these tall vertical um, briselets. It really addresses the uh, the, the public park. Um, and then as you come in the library, because it's this piece that's pulled out, it starts to um, open up um, quite a bit, um, so that you know we can get light also from the north side, which is obviously um, quite beneficial. Um, and then there's a little terrace, uh, which kind of belongs to the um, to the offices. The atrium, which is the thing that sort of hold, pulls everything together, the atrium roof, I should say, is a pretty complicated geometry. Um, these are some drawings or some model studies that we did um, about which way the roof should span. This is showing the logical sort of span in the short direction that the engineers wanted. And then this is, you can see the, the, the other complex aspect of it is its curve. It, it's kind of three-dimensionally curving and triangular, and um, it's, uh, it was a complex shape to define. Um, and then this is the way that the sun uh, studies wanted the, uh, the, the, the beams to be in the roof, which kind of were running the opposite direction. So there was this kind of whole bunch of models done to sort of, you know, who's going to win the sun or the span. Um, the span is the most expensive part, so that kind of won. And uh, th th this is more or less what was, what was built. This is, it also has these kind of triangular columns that pick up the end of the roof, and they also <laughs> get the water because the whole roof is kind of illogically sloping you know, over the en down over the entrance and kind of has its lowest point actually exactly where the entrance is. So, you know, we had to really make sure that uh, the water didn't kind of come cascading. It has a very tight relationship with um, the existing buildings. You can kind of see it here, kind of getting crowded in one corner and then kind of opening up as it, you know, sort of pulls all of these um, sort of elements uh, together. Very briefly and finally, um, this is uh, uh, not a civic office building. It's a little entrance pavilion um, in front of Leinster House, which is the House of Parliament in Ireland. Um, and it's located in Dublin. The big issue was making a 40 square meter security pavilion that you couldn't see. So security, invisible, sounds good, difficult enough to do, I guess. We made, put all the structure in the roof um, with these kind of beams made out of uh, uh, glue laminated uh, uh, larch. And um, underneath that, we have this desk that's made out of, um, oh, my time is up. Um, two more seconds, made out of um, uh, uh, Irish marble and uh, Irish oak. Um, so this is the study of the beam. It was made also down in Italy, actually, kind of north of Milan. Um, this is it's, uh, uh, near Cuomo, actually. This is uh, the kind of montage in the factory. Um, and then it uh, on site, and you see the sort of Connemara marble, which also comes from Italy um, because they bought the quarry, um, and so it all gets shipped down there. Um, and then this is what it looks like from the, the street, sort of invisible. You have the National Library to the, to the right and then the House of Parliament behind. Thanks. Thank Thank you. The practice of Hinahan Peng was established in Dublin in 2001 after winning the competition for the civil offices of Kildard County Council. This pro pro project captured the attention of many, many internationally because of the unusual way it integrates architecture and landscape 
not by the landform methods elsewhere dominant, but rather with tectonic and environmental ideas. They went on to be successful in winning several other international competitions, including that for the Grand Egyptian Museum in 2003, and for a project, a bridge on the 75, the only bridge on the 75 kilometer stretch of the Rhine River protected under, under UNESCO heritage in a collaborative process with Arup where they achieved a low pro profile that allows the bridge to practically disappear from particular viewpoints. This sleight of hand is exemplary of their tactics, subtlety and mastery of constraints. These are their means to develop new spatial and formal strategies. Their School of Architecture in Greenwich is another project which needed to sit discreetly in a protected landscape but in this case, the social dimension of the program becomes significant in its own terms, making landscapes something that extends from the interior. It is, moreover, directly across from the masterpiece, Hawksmoor's Church St. Alfred, another constraint, another demand, which spurred them to innovation. Roshin and Shifu have taught at Cornell and MIT, and as all of you know, they are presently here teaching a very interesting studio about the introduction of new architecture in dense urban environments. Welcome, Shifu. Um, probably first and foremost uh, to acknowledge that the, the work that's going to be presented is actually not the work of Hin and Peng, but rather the work of a close collaboration with um, our engineers. Probably more of the work would be um, associated with Arab for, for the Egypt as uh, the first project and Dewis McFarland for the second project, the um, Giants Causeway. Um, Geographically and symbolically, uh, Egypt is characterized by an intense juxtaposition. Um, the, the green of the Nile Valley, uh, which is a green probably even more intense than that of Ireland, representing life, and the barrenness, op op the barrenness of the desert plateau, uh, which represents death. The Nile Valley actually carves a space uh, out of the desert, uh, creating this level difference between the upper level of the plateau, the desert, and the lower level of the Nile, separated by some 50 to 70 meters. Much of what we know of the architecture of Egypt is actually uh, from the upper level, which is also where the tombs as well as the pyramids are. The site is actually precisely at the confluence or uh, collision of these two conditions, the, the green of the Nile Valley and the desert barrenness. The museum is actually inscribed. There's the line showing the separation of the two. The museum is actually inscribed um, by a connection of radial lines to the three pyramids with a series of further lines subdividing it to create the thematic bands that would support the exhibition as well as the museum. The museum is then tucked inside the hillside um, with the um, uh, primary facade forming the cliff face, uh, which is the 50 to 70 meter di level difference, and the roof continuing, continuing the Duno landscape over its uh, roof surface. The main facade, which would be known as the TSW or translucent stone wall, is um, made out of a onyx material. It would be um, um, it pretty much is the cliff face during the day, the 50 to 70 meter drop, but at night the lights from behind it will illuminate its surface, which would project this iconic image, um, um, transforming it between day and night. The a few issues with this. Um, um, probably the first thing that, that came about was the issue of the procurement of the stone. It is, a, it is to some degree a precious stone. Um, we needed over 200,000 square feet of it, which is over football, four, four football fields. So the old issue of the practicality of procurement, the quality and the quantity all started to become online in terms of also its performance. The onyx itself is actually a, um, it's actually a silicate material, which is effectively glass. And because it's glass, it has fissures. The reason why m a lot of people have asked why we don't use alabaster, because alabaster is uh, at the base level gypsum, which means it's nothing more than plasterboard. And that's why it's mostly used for vases and um, um, plates. 
Given the silicate nature of it, it has a tr uh, tremendous amount of fixtures, and simultaneously the fissures are highly unpredictable in terms of the extraction of the stone from the quarry, which means at the end of the day, the yield on the stone meaning, means it's, um, to a high degree, very small blocks of stone. How do we actually um, accommodate this particular weakness within the overall design? So first of all, it's most important thing to uh, actually understand the, 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 the internal properties of the stone. The upper left-hand corner is granite, which is one of the probably the strongest of the stones. You can actually see that it's divided into a series of rows, uh, two rows, preconditioning and post-conditioning. And what you can begin to see, especially in the, the bottom two rows, is that the, that the fissures actually begin to darken over time, meaning there's actually a degradation over this lifespan of the old building. So what we had to do is um, stress test it, and it was something in something called HALT, or highly accelerated life testing. And it actually simulates the performance of the material, not at the time of building, but it actually takes into account the degradation of the material properties relative to its performance over time to understand its performance over the lifespan of the project. Over here, you can actually see the UV chamber, which actually exposes it to 100 years of UV, perform uh, UV light. Simultaneously, it looks like uh, dramatic variations in temperature, humidity, and actually blasted with sand over 100 years to understand its performance over that time. So next, this issue of scale. Probably a good way to look at the building is on the right-hand side, you actually see the Seattle Library by OMA, and on the left-hand side is the museum itself. It's approximately the same height, which is 60 meters, but the museum, given this, uh, the length of the site, is almost a kilometer long. How do we deal with the issue of scale, especially what, what supports the, 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 the stone itself? Uh, we'll zoom into a mega frame. So the overall geometry of the wall is actually initially broken down into a, a series of uh, 43 mega frames, which are a series of triangles. These triangles with the guy on the left is, is subdivided using a fractal system um, called Sierpinski gasket, which is a binary system similar to that of computer goat, meaning it halves itself. So there you can see half, quarter, eighth, and it effectively every level reduces the buckling length of the wall. 16th, 30 seconds, so it's like megabytes, and you keep on going, 30 seconds. The total number of stones in the end is 1,024, or one megabyte. And given the fact that it's a binary uh, fractal pattern, you can actually oscillate the surface from the inside to the outside to allow it to actually achieve a degree of uh, shadow along its surface, uh, depth along its surface. And what's, interest, uh, what's also useful about the fact is that it, because the wall is freestanding, it needed to be self-stiff. And, the, uh, and its capacity to kind of subdivide itself and reduce buckling length on a half-half module allows the wall in plane to be have this extremely stiff quality. So the issue of the stone. The trouble with the binary system is for every one, you end up with a zero, a zero being a void, which basically so, f so that as you subdivide, it produces a series of voids over its entire pattern, scaling from the larger of the 60 meters back down to the smallest of the, the stone variable. Like a tennis racket, what we did was we then filled in the voids with two sets of cable nets, one which de dealt with the horizontal wind loads and the second one which dealt with the dead load of the stone. There you can see that the steel, the wind load, and the dead low cable net. And furthermore, in order to accommodate the unpredictability of the extraction of the stone, we actually further looked down th at the subdivision of the stone at the lowest level, which given the flexural strength of the stone, allowed us to pin the stones together without actually increasing the amount of steel, which is actually about five times the cost of the stone, if not more. Even the nodes themselves actually needed to accommodate this cable net, which unlike a tennis racket, the strings can't overlap, which is why tennis racket strings break. So like a binary system, the, the nodes themselves even had to accommodate uh, the, the levels at, to allow the cables actually to glide past each other. Here's the, the, the system. You can see the upper right-hand corner, how the cables works at a different level, the overall stone. And given the binary nature of the, the system, it actually begins to accommodate the, the, the span capacity over different lathes. So here you can see a cross-section through the elements, the, upper, the left one being the 900 depth, spanning 60 meters, um, and then 30 meters, uh, 15 meters, seven and a half, and two and a half. And given the every second, every level, every level basically reduces by having of each, uh, actually having or quartering of each other. So there you can see at the deepest level, which is 900 depth spanning the overall length of 60 meters or 20 story building, 10 story building, five story building, two and a half story building, one and a half story building, 0.75 story building. So the, the steel actually then uh, subdivides and reduces its overall depth. There you can see the 900 element, 
the 600 element, 300 element, and so forth. A view of the structure on the left hand and the right hand side, you, you can see the steel in the center is the tension net, the view of the museum. The Giants Causeway is a project uh, competition we've won some time back. Uh, it's on the northern coast of Ireland. Um, it's a beautiful landscape. It's characterized by very unique uh, geological ro uh, basalt rocks, uh, be, uh, which occur when lava flows into the ocean at a very precise temperature, which causes the fractalization of these um, um, uh, stones themselves. Uh, since the 17th century, because of its easy access, it has actually been a tourist destination for as long as uh, for over 300 years, uh, posted from the past. The visitor center is actually for two sets of program, one which is the visitor center, and the other, but most importantly, is at the, at, it's actually the car park. It's situated on the lower left hand, co uh, on the bottom edge at the tip on the other side of the cliff face. The project is effectively two steps in the landscape, one going up on the left-hand side, one going down on the right-hand side, left accommodating the visitor center, right the car park of over 350 cars. Here you can see the two cuts. One goes up for the visitor, down for the car park, revealing the striations of the basalt column and the structure. Uh, the, and the stone itself. The materiality of the stone is actually quite interesting. It, for lack of a better word, it's a highly contingent structural uh, nature of the stone. It has six, it has actually six sides to it. And the reason you never see a basalt column standing on its own, it actually relies on two of the sides touching another stone column in order to gain its support. Hence the, f the fact that you only see them in a topography and never as a single column because they will never hold up by themselves. Organization of subdividing on the left-hand side is the car visitor center. You can actually see the car park is about six to seven times the size of the visitor center. So even though the, the building was important, because of the size of the car park, it actually became it presented itself in terms of a, a need to address its architectural legibility. So therefore, the one thing that cannot change in order to subdivide the site is actually the grid of the car park radius, which uh, which is the par car parking system. It's based on a 6666 meter module, which is car parking two-way drive out car parking. In order to accommodate the stone facade, we had to further subdivide the car parking into a smaller number in order to accommodate the size of extraction of the stone. Here you can see the uh, random nature of the basalt columns. So the basalt. Part of the sustainability agenda is not to import the stone from China at half the price, but to actually use local basalt. Um, and unfortunately, given the local basalt, it actually, given its properties, can be ground up, and for all intents and purposes, is only used for roads. So how do we deal with the weak capacity of this stone? Further testing was actually done through prior to tender. We drove rods into it. We broke up stones to determine the waste ratio, which is a ratio of one to four. For every one stone extracted, four would be wasted. This shows the compressive and the flexural strength of the stone. The other two, the, the top one, 275 MPA, very strong, close to granite. Flexural strength, extremely weak, 5 to 15. But what is, what's interesting about this is actually not the strength of the stone. It's the fact that the line is not straight, which means the extraction of the stone is unpredictable. And how do we build this unpredictability, the unpredictability into the overall tender process of design? So this means the stone must be used in compression, which is the old Parthenon method. On the left-hand side, you see a Doric column. The, the great thing about a Doric column has a five to one ratio, and the dead load of the column is extremely heavy, which means you can't push over something which is fat and wide. However, given the nature of basalt, it is very small, and we don't have the dead load of the stone, so it becomes very flimsy. How do we actually bring that back into compression? So the stones are actually stacked so you start with the bottom, a steel plate, you stack them on top, and you actually string them together with a series of tension rods, and the tension rods would simulate the compressive load uh, on a relative nature that the, the individual columns would actually perform for wind load similar to that of a Doric column, effectively using the high technology to actually simulate uh, it, its needed dead load to resist the overturning load on the columns themselves. On the left-hand side, it shows the extraction of the stone. We have 600 stone, 450 stone, and 150. And lo and behold, the extraction process didn't yield the 4 to 1 ratio, which we actually did. However, we built that into the construction process. So when the yield of the large stone actually begins to go down, the subdivisions within the also the columns begin to shift based on a, on a system. And, and effectively, 
what ends up happening is that the facade of the building becomes a registry of the re extraction of the stone from the quarry. So if you're walking along column line A, you would say, oh, that's July. That was a good extraction day. We got rid of very large boulders. Go to column line B, we see that was a really bad month. The stone was very small. The number of subdivisions actually decreased. So as you walk along the, five, uh, the facade itself, you can track six months of extraction in terms of uh, the sizes of stone and the, uh, its, its um, the sizes throughout the, time, throughout the whole period. A construction process, you can see here the elements. The central one is the alignment dowel. The two sides are actually the tension rods that go through it. The plate, the tension rod, the stacking of the stone, and the final capping of the stone. Here you can actually see the subdivision of the system. Um, the subdivision is actually a, a, a realignment of the angles. So you get, there's a series of three angles. The widths of the stone are all the same, but by twisting the angles, you actually produce different sizes for the stone. Sorry, different shapes for the stone, but all the same width and variations of subtraction addition to create the random pattern. So the steel columns, in order to acknowledge the shift, rather than using just a, uh, a rectilinear column and rotating it, we bifurcated the column into a series of 25 mil steel, steel plates, shifted them by 37.5 degrees in the vertical direction, which allowed us to create the angular nature of the grid by, by, by actually using an orthogonal system to actually show this nature. This is the bolting together of the columns. And you can actually see the view of the columns center and the shift in the plates that support the roof above. And the last thing, not only did we have a weak stone, we actually had a weak balustrade, given the geometry of the building. On the left-hand side, the three kilonewton load that needed to be sustained, but you can actually see the loading of the balustrade is at an acute angle. Normally, for three kilonewtons, you want to resist the exact same amount in three kilonewtons in the perpendicular direction, most efficient. Unfortunately, it puts uh, our orientation puts the steel at the along the long side of the triangle, which means there's 40 percent more steel, 75,000. How do we deal with this without increasing? Uh, the cost of the project, we need to just pull it back and resolve the over tri overall triangle in the plane of the facade. And we achieve this by adding two simple rods to actually complete the triangle. So within each field, which is the length of a truck, we simply just add two steel rods. And that's the project. Some of the developments in practice underway, I, I thought, in, uh, in Ireland. I mean, one of the things that's really of interest right now among students and discussions about models of practice is kind of a general idea about agency, you know, what the role of architects, uh, what architects' roles are in society today. And it seems to me that what we do see in Ireland is um, we have been seeing some significant changes in the way governance affects practice and practice affects governance. And there's this notion of, of transparency and democratization, um, which from my understanding, some of you have argued did, has opened up a certain kind of discourse around a number of issues, particularly with the way in which uh, services are delivered, um, issues of construction, which seem to have really been a part of how your ideas have emerged, um, you know, even though you're practicing around the world, um, there is something about that ethos. Would, would it be fair to characterize the situation that way? Is there a difference arising from the circumstances of practice that you could speak to? Anyone could jump in. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess there is a certain um, there has been certain uh, fluidity about way, about working in Ireland that maybe doesn't exist, and we've all had the opportunity of working in that context in the last number of years, in, and uh, has allowed us to engage in 
in a pretty multidisciplinary process from day one of a project, which I think is very, uh, kind of gets manifest in, in a project in that way. It's not about um, segregating the process of design and construction into design and production and construction is very much an integrated, uh, can be a very much an integrated project process from, from day one. And uh, I guess we believe that the architect should be at the centre of that, choreographing that, you know, being the core choreographer at the centre of that, you know, um, integrating all the ideas from, uh, from a multidisciplinary team from day one and synthesising those ideas and bringing those forward. And it does uh, allow for working with engineers, for example, and other consultants from day one, does produce a different type of work, I think, as opposed to architect designs form, sends to engineers to make it stand up, sends to MD engineer to fit in all his kit into the suspended ceilings and all the places left over. Uh, you know, I guess we try and challenge things in an integrated way from the beginning, so that, for example, <coughs> structure of the building can not just be about holding it up, but can be about doing a lot of other things, for example, thermal mass and things like this. So, mm -hmm. And that kind of design and work, uh, way of working does um, require a certain fluidity in the, in, in the way the practice is set up. And um, very interesting question. I think um, what, what a very small country, um, very few resources goes suddenly to lots of resources and lots of opportunity to build and um, not a great structure of um, management or control of that. It's, it's I interesting, it's almost a political question, it's kind of like you're, um, what you were saying. I think um, you could say architects benefited from that freedom and that if it had been a, a more structured society with a longer history of um, methodology even rules and regulations, I think the work might have been less diverse. But I think that didn't happen, and there was an opportunity for architects to actually um, gain a position in that, and to actually, and again, at the scale of the place, I think it's, an, it's, it's a very important thing that Ireland is very small, it's tiny. People, um, personal exchange is very important. Um, architects were able to get involved in the debate and evolution about the nature of building. A lot of the buildings we're talking about are public buildings, um, big debate about, about the image or the, or the, and the presentation of, of civil society in that country. Very much an evolving debate. Everything from, from kind of Scandinavian modernism to mm -hmm. different ways of doing that. And I think architects were at a, they were, it, was a it was a useful pass that they were able to, um, to take a role in. I'd be curious actually to pick up on I mean, when you say there's a debate about identity, um, I'm free being honest, I just happened to have been in Berlin last week, and you know, the whole history of the kind of Cold War of architecture between the East and the West, which is half eradicated, that is the Eastern side, kind of obliterated evidence of that battle. But there were really specific identities that represented an idea of government in that context. And in this case, you're talking about debates among architects about different modernities or different and importations of modernism. I, I'm not clear then what those represent vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, I don't know, an idea of Irish democracy. How, how does, you know, Scandinavian versus some other, not, not understood to be Scandinavian, <laughs> uh, modernism, you know, come into a debate really? With reference to these questions of democratization, I guess I'm wondering. It's not so clear. So, is it about the question whether it would be a unified style, or is it about one representing something as opposed to another? Um, I don't really follow the question entirely, but um, I think that the, the, you know, when you talk about architecture trying to express something within the society it is also very much about you know how the practice of construction works within that society and how the how discourse um, drives um, well dis discourse discussion between people kind of drives new ideas and new working methodologies and I think that the unencumbered nature maybe of 
um, of, of working in Ireland. When I say unencumbered, I mean, you know, unencumbered by lots of rules and regulations. I mean, we're in the EU and we have rules and regulations. It's not like we don't have them, but, but discourse is more important than all of that. In other words, the way that people interact is supersedes often the, let's say, the systems that are set up. And that's very useful when you're talking about, you know, when you're talking to an engineer from Paris, for example, who says, look, you know, uh, we, you can't do this because of blah, 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 blah. And you say, well, you're not in Paris, you're in Dublin, and we don't, we don't know about all that stuff, so let's keep going. And I think that that also makes, it, it, it's not that it makes more technology possible, because that's, that's the technological example, but um, it also, I think, means that when people come to Ireland, and you know, perhaps this is something that, because, you know, in a way, a lot of, certainly during, when there was a lot of economic activity, a lot of construction, a lot of people were kind of showing up in Ireland as if it was kind of, as if they just discovered it, not just myself and Shifu, but other people as well, and, you know, like it was a kind of a new America, and I think that um, with that brought uh, an engagement with this culture, and uh, within architecture, I think it definitely opened up um, uh, the beginning of something, you know, kind of something interesting, and I certainly hope that it's something that, you know, can permeate all of the sort of the societies that we've, you know, the kind of processes that Karen was talking about of, you know, uh, the way that team design teams are constructed and the processes of um, the the legal um, and kind of lead and BREEAM and all these kinds of systems that tend to drive things in certain directions. These are difficult things that, that discourse, I think, much more productively address discourse, discussion much more pr productively can address. On this man. Oh, you're going to leave it to rest? <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought I would open up to the floor. I think there probably are some questions. Specific, general, any number of topics. Thank you. Mark. This is uh, a question in the forming, so I want to make a, a, a comment uh, first that I, I realize that you all are in a little bit difficult situation of, in the one sense, uh, you are three practices uh, that in this context are representing what's going on in Ireland today. So if I make generalizations of, or let's say connections between your work, um, you can f please feel free to say, well, that's may be true of us, but not necessarily representing Ireland today. I, I want to say I was very struck by the, the sort of subtle and surgical nature and the fragmentation of, uh, let's say, form in each of your works in very different ways, but that uh, uh, there's a sense, sort of sense of uh, a strong geometric genesis um, that then, in terms of the perception of form, maybe because it's so sensitive to context, doesn't Im result in a very strong overall image. In fact, we see a lot more sort of breakdown and fragmentation. Almost, in some cases, I'm thinking the, the very last pavilion that uh, uh, Karen and um, Merritt showed, uh, almost the disappearance of the architecture. So I'm very struck by that. And secondarily, uh, emerging from a kind of a strong uh, geometric generation, I'm struck by instances of incredible fragility uh, of the materials. And maybe that relates very much to Shifu's uh, characterization of stone and the brittle nature of, of, of all this. It sounds, you should probably react to the fact that I called your kilometer long uh, museum uh, invisible architecture. I don't think that actually applies there, but in Ireland it's different. Uh, the fragility, the, the nature of the handrail is something that's more fragile than it needs to be. The balustrade that you showed at the very end, um, the, the ruin, um, these are all things that, that somehow link this work to me. And I wonder if you, any of you could comment on those things as being essentially <laughs> Irish characteristics or something maybe that you're not uh, aware is an is a underlying linkage. Was that a question? <laughs> <laughs> Good introduction. Um, I think um, it kind of goes back to merit rather than um, a characterization of fragility. It's more an openness to work with something which is inherently 
unpredictable and fragile. And as opposed to, for example, we would never be able to build Giants Causeway anywhere, really anywhere else, because once you pummel down on codes and restrictions and, and risk, you do your risk assessment, it goes out the window. Um, and in some ways, that kind of space really allows us to kind of innovate. And that it, it allows us to find new techniques and et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and it is brought on in some ways by a certain degree of desire. We want to do this, which brings about, and once we desire comes through, it produces, by, by once material enters, fragility enters, and then from fragility, we reinvent. And the space in Ireland does allow that. Uh, well, I mean, it's difficult to ask a question which might be relevant to everyone. Uh, and maybe Ireland is a bit of a red herring or a green herring, I don't know. But um, um, <laughs> see, um, one thing which I have often wondered is that living in London, one um, often sees Irish builders. And there is a, a very long past of um, building both obviously in Ireland and also abroad. And one question which I have often asked myself is um, whether this very strong presence of the building craft in Ireland um, has um, had, perhaps still has an impact on how people actually um, think and make architecture in Ireland. I think that the the building craft that I that one experiences is more a European building craft, I suppose. I mean, most of the buildings, most of the materials, in fact, that come into Ireland are 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 imported, except for concrete, of course. But there is very little that's in stone. But there's very little that's um, other than that that's made there, and uh, maybe sheet sheet um, what is it called particle board, um, because the trees that grow there are not really. Um, that great for other things, but the the other aspect that's kind of missing, uh, which is um, maybe different, is the um, I suppose the the strength of vocational trades and you know the the ways of working that are um, I don't know how embedded they are. Certainly, plastering, as I talked about earlier, concrete, those things are very very strong and give you a sense of um, th you know they relate very directly to how people, in fact, end up understanding buildings. When I say people, I mean you know in in, in the street sort of thing, you know building is made out of stone, I understand that, or concrete, I understand that, or plaster, I understand that. But other things where craftsmanship is in fact involved, it's harder to, um, I suppose, it, it's important, well, it's harder to uh, to find people who can um, who can do certain <coughs> kinds of things. So you often find that the, the European context is actually quite beneficial because you're, you know, kind of part of this very open kind of trade. And it's not just for, you know, the practicing of making buildings, literally, the, the kind of artisanal aspect of it, but also the, of course, the uh, professional services aspect of it, you know, that there's a kind of a, let's say, free trade. Um, and Ireland, probably way more than any other European country, is completely open to having consultants coming from kind of anywhere. You know, it's more difficult, definitely, for, um, you know, for, for consultants from different countries to trade as freely as they do, for example, in the United States, you know, across state lines sort of thing. These lines in Europe are much more set. So, but in Ireland, I think, it, it, you know, it kind of means that, you know, if you want to get something made in, in Austria or made in Germany or, or, or Italy or whatever, or have a consultant that's coming from there, and equally, if you want to go and work in those places, um, it's, it's pretty easy. Whether that whole thing has become embedded within a kind of common understanding of architecture in terms of practice and, uh, 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 let's say, craft, I don't know. I mean, I think the country's a little bit too, maybe comes back to Neil's question about scale. You know, you don't have, you know, four and a half million people, y you, can't <laughs> you can't really cover all the bases with that. Um, but once you're part of something a bit bigger and kind of can use it in a clever way, then you can do kind of interesting, interesting things. Um, 
do you meet much opposition to your work? I mean, I, I come from, from Donegal and I remember once being at a public meeting at which a kind of a radical new building was being presented and and someone said that the the building was more, or that I think the, the comment was that it was not Milan, you know, mm -hmm. that, that good design belongs in Milan but not really in Ireland. So the opposition wasn't necessarily to the design or to the fact that it was new, but it was more to, well, you know, that the, the design belongs elsewhere. And I'm just wondering, do you meet that? And there's, a, there's, a, there's a definite truth that um, uh, history gives people a sense of of, of wanting to get out from under things and uh, a certain freedom about um, making con making contemporary buildings. I've, I've, I haven't really found that in my experience. I found more the opposite. I've, I've uh, seen and been involved in societies where the opposition to contemporary arch architecture is very organized and um, has a very clear set of, of rules and images that they want to present. And that generally hasn't been that generally hasn't been certainly our experience I don't know if it's been your experience it's been it's been um, it's been a great freedom I suspect as things densify it gets less good actually and that what you're saying may start to happen but at the moment no it hasn't happened it may have been more the case before 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 the new energy started to come back into the country, uh, certainly we experienced uh, quite an openness when we started working on the rules and the competition. And, and the openness of the competition system was really liberating for us, and, and I think it was you know, uh, motivating and inspirational for a lot of young architects for complete, <coughs> open, anonymous competition. It's, you know, we were totally unknown when we won that competition. And that was about having a, an enlightened client as well. Um, you know, on that whole program of, of county hall programs, um, which produced some um, great programs for many years and others as well, um, was a result of that. Um, but I think opposition within, I mean, just opposition within society to architecture is pretty, um, says, it says it's not, it's not, you know, society isn't really galvanized enough about these things. And uh, I think in a certain way, um, you know, there's a kind of ambivalence about the past, which is really in Ireland, which is really helpful. Um, you know, you're coming from, you know, other countries which have a much more, you know, a much stronger relationship with the past and kind of constantly are bringing it up in a way. Um, and, and, and I think that this also goes back to the point that uh, that we were making earlier, perhaps about the the importance of, of discussion within our society as, as kind of superseding. Um, rules and regulations makes lots of things possible, you know, not just within architecture. I mean, this is just kind of, um, <laughs> you know, uh, 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 maybe perhaps something that I think, um, uh, you know, within a kind of political discourse, particularly political discourses that you see erupting kind of all over the place now, um, quite refreshing. And, uh, you know, I think that, that that architecture plays a part in that is, is kind of great. That architectural culture kind of has something to contribute to the nature and quality of discourse, both as kind of resolving, you know, technological issues and maybe kind of, um, you know, uh, being innovative, but also, uh, you know, producing somehow, you know, nothing that's too kind of uh, fixed in terms of its imagery. Nothing that's kind of, you know, because there's so much of that stuff. I mean, Ireland is a country that's sort of, you know, for better or for worse, is laden with imagery when you're looking at it from the outside, and but from the inside, that you know is is completely uh, up for grabs. And uh, you know, it kind of goes back to what you were asking about the kind of fractal nature of the work. And I think that that's really kind of I don't know if it's stealthy or intended or anything like that, but it is kind of it is it is very important. You know, it is it does end up becoming a, um, a, a you know a mode of of, of working that is. Um, necessary more than maybe more than um, uh, more than intentional. <laughs> well, I'm, 
briefly just want to express my thanks to you all for bringing <coughs> your work to the school. This was really an interesting experience to recognize those threads that run through, but also the very distinctive and individual approaches. It seems a place of a great deal of freedom, a great deal of independent kinds of approaches, as you were saying, Neil. It's really not about uh, you know the establishment of a continuous language, um, and yet in such a small place, um, there's a certain kind of intensity to it. Um, very unusual, very interesting work. Thank you so much. Thank you.